You're listening to the Untitled Car Show in partnership with RightFootDown.com. Visit RightFootDown for your daily automotive fix. If you enjoyed today's program, please tell a friend. It's the best way to support this show. If you want to visit the archives, go to YouTube and search for Untitled Car Show. That'll bring you to the archived episodes. If you want to follow this show, just search for Untitled Car Show on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can always send an email to the show at Untitled Car Show at rightfootdown.com. We're so glad you decided to spend the next hour or so with us. Without further ado, let's get into today's program. Let's, um, yeah, so we'll just go ahead and pick up right from here. So uh, on tonight's show, we have Mike Garland. He is the uh, PR manager over with Carlisle Events, and I hope I didn't screw that up because I forgot to write it down when you explained it to me. Michael, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on the show. All right. uh, first and foremost, let's just kind of get out of the way. If somehow you are listening to this and you don't know what Carlisle is, it's basically um, automotive mecca on the East Coast. It's like where all the big national events are held for makes like, you know, Ford, GM, you have Corvettes, you have imports. Um, I don't think there's a type of vehicle not represented at Carlisle over the course of the year. So. Yeah, I would, I would say you're absolutely correct there. I mean, some of the shows that we do are, without a doubt, the largest of their type in the world. And, and uh, Carlisle is one of those destinations for people that, uh, whether they come every year or come just once, uh, if you're a gearhead, you make a point to be at the Carlisle Fairgrounds at some point. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's absolutely massive. I um, was fortunate enough last year, uh, you invited me up there. I went just wandering around up there, just in awe of how big and how much is there. I went during a Ford Nationals last year, and it is super impressive, the event that goes on and everything that goes into that event. I can't imagine from from your perspective leading up to an event, like what is it that you have to do? Obviously, you're the PR guy, so put out the word and all that stuff. So what are your what is your role in putting together an operation like a National Ford Day or something like that? Well, I'll tell you what, man. I mean, a lot of people, when you tell them that you work at the fairgrounds, especially locally in central Pennsylvania, they look at you and say, is that a full-time job? You know, what do you do all year long? And if if they only knew, I mean, I have a, a boss, and I'll still call her my new boss, even though she's been my boss for like two years. Um, she's done a lot to change the way that uh, the marketing and creative services department uh, does their jobs. But before her, I could easily stake claim to doing about, 12 months of work over a nine month period of time. Um, the, the amount of prep that goes into a season, whether it's placing the ads to promote the show to the press releases, to um, the event promotion. When we go to a show like the Detroit Autorama show, or maybe the Philadelphia auto show. Um, we had our Ford event manager went to a, a Ford show at the Knott's Berry farm a couple of years ago in California so a lot of the front end stuff that we do is really what consumes us. And I know that for me, uh, on the PR side of things, I try to get information in front of publications about three months in advance. So really my year, as the car show goes, works about three months in front of everyone else. Uh, and by the time September comes around, in my head, I'm done because I've written all the, all the press releases for the year. I've done all the, uh, the promotion, and then I just have to sit around and wait for the events to happen. Now, when when an actual event goes down, um, I think I saw when I went. Uh, were you walking around with Mr. Regular of Regular Car Reviews last year, or was I mistaking you with someone else? No, I was with him a couple of times last year. I know he came to, and what did he do? I think he was at the Ford show, and then he came to our Corvette show. But really, it was it was the Corvette show just so he could record a special feature on this Plymouth Horizon that. Uh, Bill Miller, the owner of our company, had purchased at the Chrysler show in the summer. So uh, he and I were together a couple of times, and uh, quite the unique character uh, is he. And it's always fun to have him come to the show and make fun of different aspects of what's going on. Yeah. And it's, again, when you think about automotive, like, places to go, places to be, um, 
like how did central Pennsylvania of all places on God's green earth end up being such a wonderful place for, you know, automotive people to flock to like, did, how, well, did, how did it all start? I guess is what I'm asking. You know. In 1973, uh, Bill Miller and Chip Miller, who were the co-founders of our company, they, they shared not only a, a last name, uh, but a passion for all things automotive and the guys, they're not related. Everybody thinks Bill Miller, Chip Miller, they think they're brothers. But no, they just happen to have the same last name. But they, they also share that passion for cars. And uh, I, I, I'm comfortable in saying it now because I think we have a good relationship with the people in Hershey. But uh, 1973, Bill and Chip took a 50s-era Corvette to the big fall show in Hershey uh, because you had a couple of guys that were in their 20s at the time selling a car that was about as old as they were. And I mean, if you think about it, I, I'm 38. If I look at a car that's 20 years old, it seems like an old car to me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, to the uh, pre-war mentality of what was the Hershey show then, it was not a car suitable for their event. So Bill and Chip were asked to leave the Hershey show and take their 50s era Corvette and get out. And uh, it, it basically came down to those guys saying, man, it would be nice if there was a place where guys like us that are into cars like we like could, could get together and we could show off our, our post-war cars. And uh, they put a couple of hundred dollars up each and rented the Carlisle Fairgrounds. And in 1974, one week before the Hershey show, they launched what was called post-war 74. And uh, all these years later, it's what we know as Fall Carlisle. But uh, it basically all started because two guys got thrown out of an event and, uh, and took, took their ball and made their own game. It, it, it's such a wonderful story that that's how it got started because it, it's very reminiscent of like a lot of great automotive stories like you know Lamborghini getting pissed at Ferrari because Ferrari basically batted him off like that it seems like the way the great things get created in this world seems to be good people getting shut out of stuff by jackasses not that Hershey was that but maybe maybe just a little bit uh, my words, not yours. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and you know what, though? Like I said, we, we, I think we have a good enough relationship. I mean, we set up at the Hershey Show now every year uh, with a vending booth. I think that um, there is some benefit to both of our events taking place when they do because at Fall Carlisle, you have many vendors that come to our event that then just stay over and go to the Hershey Show. You have enthusiasts that come in from around the world that go to Fall Carlisle and then stay in the area and then go to the Hershey Show. So, yeah, there's a lot of great benefits. And then I think that the location – of our venue is the uh, is the magic to it all as well. I mean, we are located uh, in the hotbed of, of central Pennsylvania, crossroads to basically the mid-Atlantic uh, highway system. Um, we have a phrase that says all roads lead to Carlisle, which is, is kind of true. The Pennsylvania Turnpike uh, is right against our facility on the north side of the grounds. Uh, and that, that, of course, will take you all the way across the state. And uh, Interstate 81 is uh, about five miles from our facility, and that's, you know, upstate New York through Knoxville, Tennessee area. Uh, You have I-83, which takes you through the Harrisburg area into Baltimore, D.C. Metro. Route 15 is up out of D.C., uh, Baltimore, into uh, northern Pennsylvania. So there really are a lot of major roadways that that intersect and transect uh, Pennsylvania, even I-80, which is, uh, about an hour and a half north of Carlisle is still a major uh, crossroads to the country, especially for those that don't want to pay the tolls on the turnpike. So um, there's a lot of different highways and byways and scenic back roads that bring people to central Pennsylvania. And I think we're just in a, in a very perfect spot with our facility. We talk all the time that if you took an event, even like spring Carlisle, that gets a hundred thousand people from around the world and moved it to a town, even 30 minutes away, we'd probably see half the turnout and half the vendor base. So we're, we we had the right formula at the right time, and it's just stuck for 40-plus years. And it's – it's the fairground's huge, and then there's this, like, cute little town just kind of, like, slapped onto the side of it that, like, it's got to be crazy living in that small town because, like, there's events where there'll be a giant parade of cars that, like, goes through downtown Carlisle, you know, I can't imagine. Do you live locally to the, uh, do you live I, in I do. I, uh, I, I grew up in a small town called Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania. It's, it's adjacent to Carlisle, a neighboring town about seven miles away. And the car shows were always part of, uh, 
uh, you know, the daily vernacular in, in my area. I admit that I had never been to a car show as best I can recall until I started working for the company in 2011. Um, and it's, it's such an economic boom though for a Carlisle. I mean, our events draw a half a million people to the region every year. We're a hundred million dollar economic impact. And while a lot of the townies, if you will, don't enjoy us because of the traffic, I think that's, you know, that's par for the course, though. I mean, any any sports team that, you know, draws a lot of people in on a Sunday, you know, yeah, that's a great economic impact. But the locals that are affected by it maybe don't enjoy it as much. So, I mean, they they, they certainly appreciate us for what we are until they're stuck in traffic. And then uh, then all bets are off. Um, some of our events admittedly do cause some major traffic backlogs in the area. But we've worked a lot with uh, Carlisle Borough. Uh, North Middleton Township, which is the neighboring township to the borough and a township that part of our facility is in. We've worked very closely with these places to help get the traffic flow going uh, onto the grounds instead of backing up into the streets. Well, since we kind of touched on it, let's kind of get into this a little bit. So how, how did you get involved with working with Carlisle and in this line of work in the first place? Um, it's, it's an interesting story, at least in, in, in my opinion, in, in that I went to college at a place called Shippensburg University. It's a state school about 30 minutes south of Carlisle. And when I was in college, I always wanted to be a play-by-play guy. I, I grew up a Phillies fan, loving guys like Harry Callis and Richie Ashburn and Chris Wheeler, and just a fan of baseball overall. And you think about the, the great broadcasters, the Harry Carries, the Vin Scullys, uh, you know, guys like that. And I wanted to be a play-by-play guy. And when I was in college, I did everything that I could to be involved with sports and be on the radio. And uh, I went to the baseball winter meetings in 2000, trying to get a play-by-play job. And the writing was just kind of on the wall that, you know, while I might be good at what I do, there's a thousand good guys like me. And at that time, at 21 years old, I didn't want to sleep in the dugout or be part of the grounds crew or whatever. I wanted to just do the job. And, all these years later, I, you know, maybe hindsight being 2020, I could have paid my dues and who knows where I would have been. But that path led me to the world of media relations because I had a college classmate of mine that did a lot of the same things and ended up in what is known as sports information, which essentially is the, the PR arm of a college athletics department. And I thought that, well, if, if Scott can do this, I can do it too. So I ended up uh, working in sports information at a couple of different colleges between 2001 and uh, 2006, uh, I moved to, to Jacksonville, Florida, and got involved with a radio station in, uh, in, in the area. I was the traffic reporter. I was an on-air host, and I was back to kind of playing radio. I wasn't doing the play-by-play stuff like I wanted, but I was, I was finally making a living as a broadcast talent, if you will. And uh, at some point, I was looking to move back home, back to the central Pennsylvania area, um, my, uh, you know, unfortunately maybe ex-wife, I guess you could say, you know, at the time we were dating, we were getting married, we were looking to, to have a family and we wanted to move back to the Northeast to, to make all of that happen. And I remember Googling media relations jobs, Carlisle or something like that, you know, just kind of seeing what was in the area. And I, and I see this posting for the fairgrounds and I'm looking at the job description and I thought, oh, I can do that. I mean, I've done sports information for, for colleges that have 12, 14 teams. So what's the difference? I mean, instead of doing, you know, men's basketball and women's lacrosse, I'm doing Ford and Chrysler. So I applied for the job and a month or two later, my former boss called me and uh, we interviewed for the job on Black Friday of 2010. And uh, I remember he would tell me that uh, I'll call you on Monday And we'll we'll let you know, you know, either way. And okay, fine. I mean, it was a pretty comfortable interview. I didn't think much of it, although it felt more like a hangout chat session than an actual interview. And funny thing is, I was on another interview at the time that he called me. I was at a college in in, in northwestern Pennsylvania interviewing to be their, their sports information director. And I got the phone call right at the front end of the interview. And I remember the athletic director saying to me, do you need to take that or anything like that? Do you need to go to the bathroom? Well, no, I'll, I'll go to the bathroom. I'll be good. And I, I checked the voicemail, and it was my former boss offering me the job. So I actually accepted the job as the PR guy while I was on an interview for another job and probably had the best interview of my life at that college, all, all the while knowing that I wasn't going to take the job. So I uh, I started in January of 2011, and uh, you know here I am all these years later still with my nose to the grindstone, pumping out press releases and posting to social media and walking the grounds and meeting people and doing fun things like this. It, it, 
first of all, I have to, you know, I'm listening to you, um, and I, you sounded like something. Like, I was like, he sounds like something. I, I, there, there's a vision in my mind when I heard your voice where it was something, he needs to be doing something, and it was, as soon as you said sports guy, I'm like, he needs to be announcing baseball. That's what that voice is. That's a voice for announcing baseball. Um, so <laughs> there's that. Um, it, it's such a crazy thing that, like, you know, sometimes you move around, you bounce around, and you end up, you know, I spent the first 18 years of my life trying to get out of the, you know, what I thought was a podunk town I was living in. And then it's been like the rest of my life trying to get back to that where you've kind of like you, the further you get from home, kind of the more you kind of miss it. So I, I really understand that. Like I want to get back home. I want to kind of re-engage with that. And, you know, it's got to be wonderful to be back home doing something as enjoyable as this. Cause I can't imagine, you know, I imagine the stress level is high per se doing this because there's a bunch of stuff you got to do. And like you said, 12 months worth of work in a nine month period. But on the flip side of that, I imagine it's not the day to day grind. That's something like, um, you know, TV announcing or like doing whatever you were, what you were doing in Florida it just sounds like, you know, it might look like fun, but it actually, it's so much more stressful on a like moment by moment basis. I don't know. Yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I mean, the, the one great thing about what I do now is that there really is something different all the time. I mean, some of the, the you know, the, 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 the skeleton of what I do maybe on a year to year basis is the same, but within that framework, there's a lot of variety. And I, I love, I love cold weather. I love the holiday season. Uh, it's certainly taken on a little bit of a different tone in the last six or seven months with, you know, some personal changes, but at the same time, um, it, I love that time of year with the, the fall and the changing of the, of the colors of the leaves and all of that. So, you know, I get to work hard during the summer. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the hot weather, but I get to be outside for work. So if someone's going to pay me to be outside in the hot weather, then fine. Um, but then I also get to kind of chill in the wintertime and relax. And I still have to show up and go to work and do things. But, you know, it's not a high stress level between September and January. And I enjoy what I do. I'm not a car buff, but I'm not not a car person either. I mean, I appreciate what I see. I appreciate the passion that people put into these cars. And because I don't care one way or the other, and I mean that, you know, in, in the most positive of way possible, because I don't care, I think I enjoy it the most because I don't I don't have a favoritism towards one brand or the other. Um, so I don't get too caught up in, in a show uh, over another show. I just show up and do my job and, and try and have a great time with it. I, I, I love meeting all the different people to come to the grounds. And, you know, when, when you have a half a million people coming in every year, um, you, you find some cool stories and you see some unique things. And I've been a, a pretty lucky guy to have a lot of the experiences that I've had since 2011. It's you brought up a good point. Cause if you did have a brand loyalty, if you were, you know, that guy who was super into, you know, Chrysler products like the Forge Fill might suffer. Like you, you're the perfect guy for it because you don't have that loyalty associated with all the other stuff. So, I, I'm curious, what are you driving right now? Right now, I actually have a 2017 Toyota Corolla. Uh, it is a it is a means to get around. I, uh, I I previously had a minivan, but as again the personal dynamic changes, the uh, the need for a, a lower car payment and probably a smaller car. Um, you know, came into light and I was in a position to get the 2017. So I did. And it's not because I have some brand loyalty to Toyota, but uh, I enjoy a good car payment and good gas mileage. Now, you've been, you've lived in a couple of parts of this, you know, great country of ours. I'm curious, you know, driving in Florida, especially, was there, was there ever any accident down there? Did you ever put anything in a wall or anything? I, um, I've only ever been in one car accident in my entire life. Knock on, uh, knock on the wooden desk here. And it was actually maybe two years ago. I was driving to work to our Chrysler show in my Chrysler town and country minivan. And someone ran a stop sign and I T-boned the bejesus out of them. Um, I think the van was built rather well though, because even though the front bumper of the van kind of fell off, I was able to keep driving the thing until it was time to go get to the body shop. Her car was totaled and I bent the frame and everything else. But the only time I've really been in a, in a true accident was, was yeah, about two years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty fortunate now in Jacksonville, I was a traffic reporter. So I reported on all kinds of accidents, but, uh, luckily I've only personally been in one and no one was really injured. That's kind of weird now that I think about it. You've kind of had this life associated with automobiles, but never as like a 
you know, uh, he used the words you said earlier, like gearhead. Like you don't think of yourself that way, but you traffic report working with Carlisle, you know, you, you've always kind of been around vehicles, it seems. Yeah, and you know, I, I grew up in a in a in a family that always tinkered with cars, and um, I, I think back to maybe I had a an '86 AMC Eagle as one of my first cars. I had a '93 Mercury Topaz, was a car I drove in high school. Um, my dad had a Ford conversion van that I drove every now and then. That thing was great for going out on dates. I don't know what the the girls' parents thought of that when I'd show up in a van that you know the seats folded down in the back, but. It didn't really matter. I was in high school. Um, and, and I've always, I, I always fancied myself as someone that could do a little bit of something with cars. I mean, I've, I've taken out engines with a cousin. Um, we, you know, we've done things like that. We've, we've done a, a transmission conversion um, from, uh, you know, stick to, to automatic. And I, I've always been involved, but it, I was a sports guy growing up. I mean, not only my, my interest in wanting to broadcast, but I played sports. I that that's kind of where my attention was always pulled. So I never got into you know wanting to have a classic car or you know I didn't salivate over those kinds of cars on a day to day basis. I certainly like looking at them. Don't get me wrong. I mean a, a good classic car might be like a you know a pretty girl. Uh, you know you, you you want to look at everything nice that goes by, but you just can't get in every one of them. Yeah, that's a lot more money than you're willing to spend to get in every one of them for sure. Um, the car or the woman? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> hey, it costs more to get out. That's for sure. <laughs> that's very true. Uh, the <laughs> so, but well, it's curious. So, first of all, I have to ask, what color was the topaz? Because they were always some sort of like pastel color. It was a greenish color. Oh, I know exactly. Like, kind of like a. I know exactly what that is because I had a good friend who had a topaz in '93. It was like the world's ugliest green. Like, I the don't coolest know. part about that car, though, as best I can recall, was that I drove it at a time that I was taking driver's ed in high school, and our driver's ed car was literally the exact same car. So there was no there was no confusion when it came time to get in and like take driver's ed in high school. I mean, Ms. Mr. Carell says, "Here's your car," and I said, "No, there's my car." I mean, it was it was the same thing. So that was that was the benefit to that. And it was there was no loss of knowledge like you like i don't need to know where to put the key i've already got this all down <laughs> yep exactly same bit the only thing you know that the passenger brake that the driver's ed teacher would have had i guess that would have been the only thing different mm -hmm. uh, it, it's funny too because my first car actually was a uh driver's ed car so you could actually feel the plate where the brake used to be which is oh, nice really, yeah uh, you should have just got one installed in your car just for the whole feeling of it <laughs> But I'm curious. So you've been around car people. You got the, you did an engine swap, a tranny swap. Like you, you've done work on vehicles. It, it again, it, it's kind of like you're being like magnetically drawn into this field of work. Like the universe wants you to work alongside cars. Like it, it wants you to have this deeper appreciation for it, and you get to see all these great cars. I mean, what was it like that first event going out and like, you know being the PR guy at Carlisle and the first event going up. I was so overwhelmed. I, you know, because spring Carlisle was the first show. So I'd been on the job for four months and all of a sudden there's a hundred thousand people walking around in front of me and 8,200 spaces filled with, with merchandise and memorabilia and classic cars for sale. And I looked around and I thought, what the hell am I involved with here? I, I, I just was was blown away at the magnitude of the event. And having now done it since 2011, there's not a lot that excites me at the shows anymore. But every now and then something cool comes through that actually makes me want to check it out. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's become you know, like a passive, oh, it's just part of the job thing. But I think like everything else, when you do it long enough, you, you stop getting excited about certain aspects of what you do. Um, but I still have those, oh, check it out moments at some of our shows yeah, it, it's there's something for everyone there like um you know ford might be there putting parts in or you know you have like a drag box there i think i've seen where like people can come and basically blow up their tires if they want which is yes. crazy to me like when did is that fairly recent i feel like i heard them might be something that's 
fairly recent the drag box thing well we have we've had a burnout contest for for a while um and, and you're right i don't understand why people would want to go in there and do that to their cars i uh i used to watch the burnout competition and think what could be possibly dumber than a burnout contest like a controlled chaos like this until one of our events has what's called a drop and drag which is at the truck show mm-hmm. and that's where you get like the lowered and bagged trucks that'll go down a hill and then drop the ass end out of the back of the truck and and throw sparks and and then as I was thinking, what could possibly be dumber than a burnout contest? I saw that and I said, oh, yeah, this. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's still the truck show is fun. And by the time that happens at nine o'clock on a Saturday night in August or on the back end of the show season, the truck show is a good, good time party and event. So even though it's silly and makes me wonder why people do what people do sometimes, it really is a fun time at the show. And, uh, you know, people just like the burnout contest, people pack our grandstand to watch this. And we do them at every show. And at the Corvette show, we only usually have one or two cars because, you know, Corvette, expensive. Um, And somebody last year caught his car on fire. Like, he really let it go. And the brake calibers caught on fire. And then the car caught on fire. And then the back of the car kind of melted away. And uh, he was okay with it, which is really surprising. So, um, you know, you you have those moments where as long as no one gets hurt, uh, a little destruction is always kind of nice. Yeah, it, it's it's this controlled chaos that kind of exudes there because there is so much going on there, and you know I can't imagine like the team of people you have to work with to get everything coordinated and working the way it's supposed to, you know, at Carlisle because there's simultaneously there's the drag meet there or the you know blowing up tires, and then you might have people in the back doing the swap meet, and then there might be you know someone judging like the cars up top, like it, it's. There, it's such a weird, like, it is overwhelming. Like, when I went last year, it was just like, I don't know what to do. And, like, you think you've seen every car on the planet, like, of a certain brand, and it's like, oh, here's an import from Europe from Ford for some reason. And it's just so much, you know, it's a lot to take in. I, I definitely think it's a show where um, you have to go more than once to kind of appreciate it, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, and you're not wrong, and I know you bring up the Ford show a lot, but we have a handful of shows that are yeah. just like that. I mean, and you think about the facility, it's 82 acres, it's 16 plus miles of paved roadway, and you're absolutely right. You cannot see it all in one day, and if you're going to come to a show, whether it's Spring Carlisle or the Ford show or the Import show or the Chevy show or the Chrysler show or the truck show or the Corvette show or our all-new Hearst show or, you know, whatever – Bring your walking shoes. You're going to need good footwear. Stay hydrated. It's important to, you know, be healthy when you're walking around, especially in those dog days of summer when it could be 100-plus degrees on the macadam. Um, you know, you, you, you just can't see it all in one day, which maybe is good or bad. I mean, hotels certainly make a killing on the guests that come to town, and not everybody wants to pay those prices. But, you know, at the same time, if you're if you're traveling from some distance away, I had a friend come from Florida a couple of years ago to the Ford Show, and you know, he wished he had more days in the week to experience the event because there just wasn't enough time for him. Yeah, well, what is your recommendation for someone's coming up, they're going to come to the show, what to bring with them, what to leave at home, you know, you know, what are kind of the do's and don'ts of coming to Carlisle? Well, um, we actually are pretty user friendly. I mean, I, I certainly would recommend bringing some money with you. Most of our shows cost about 10 bucks to get in. Parking is uh, anywhere between 10 and $20, depending on the show. So bring some money with you, but that's not too bad. That's not too different than if you wanted to go to a sporting event of some sort. Um, Bring your walking shoes. Bring some water if you want. And the reality is, yes, we are a company that is for profit. We we want to make uh, money wherever possible with regards to our events, our activities, and our guests. But at the same time, we don't prohibit anyone from bringing something in from the outside. If you want to bring food in, you can bring your own food. If you want to bring your own beer in, we're not going to stop you. Um, but at the same time, you don't need to be carrying around you know, a, a backpack like you're about to hike the Appalachian Trail. I mean, we, we have uh, the amenities of, of life there for you. We have indoor plumbing. We have showers if you happen to be staying on grounds. We have uh, concession stands that have a lot of really good food. We have, you know, drink stands. We have beer stands. We have souvenir shops that if you, you know, sweat through a T-shirt and you want to go buy another one, you can do that. So, I mean, there, there really is anything and everything you could want at the grounds. 
what I do see a lot of people doing is they, they bring a wagon of some sort. Like if you're really a diehard and you want to go find some parts, you want to walk the swap meet, you want to pick up some literature, some collectibles, you've got a kid that you're going to tow around all day, you know, have a wagon, have something that, you know, can take a little bit of a burden off of you because it, it can get rough. I mean, not every one of our paved roadways is, you know, smooth. <laughs> no, it's not. And there's, there's a big hill. I mean, for sure. It, um, it's just a slight slope, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it, it's not like you're gonna fall off a cliff, but it's you, it goes for it, it goes for a bit, you know. It, it just kind of it does, it, it does go up a smidge. Yeah, it it it, it's, it goes for a while. Uh, <laughs> I just remember walking up that thing, going like, "Where does this end?" Um, oh no, man! The worst thing with that hill, though, one time I saw a guy, one of those guys that had a wheelchair. That uh, you always wonder sometimes the people that have the wheelchairs but don't have the little like foot rests on their wheelchair and whatever that deal is, I don't get it. Um, but he was like getting around in the wheelchair and his friend lost hold of him. So now all of a sudden there's a guy in a wheelchair like rolling uh, uncontrolled down a hill and there's a, a real oh shit moment by the people that are watching this happen. And luckily, I guess the guy could use his hands, so he just locked down on the wheels and was able to like turn it into the grass and save himself. To some extent, I mean, he was already in a wheelchair, so I'm not sure what more was going to happen. But it, you know, the hill can play a factor into your existence at Carlisle. That's for sure. Yeah, M- make sure the wagon has brakes if you plan on putting the kids in it. Is basically what we're what we're. Or you know, there. don't let the kids go down the hill. Yeah, also true. Yeah, it, it's there's oh, it, it's like such a great place, and I do love the fact that there's beer there, there's the food, there's there's a lot of good stuff there in the swamp meat. And, like, when it comes in regards to, like, you know, stay, I didn't realize you can stay on, like, the fairgrounds. Like, yeah, we do, camping we, do or... have some, we do have some camping opportunities on the grounds for select shows. And if you can't camp on the grounds, then we have some off-site camping in uh, one of our, our parking areas. Now, when I say camping, I'm not talking like you're staying at a KOA that, you know, is like, you know, the, the, the hotel version of a campground. I mean... We will provide you a space where you can pitch a tent, and the rest is up to you. Um, we, like I said, we do have a shower, we have uh, bathhouses on grounds, uh, things like that. So you know you can you can go get April Fresh, uh, you know somewhere on the grounds. But uh, but yeah, it's it's an option for some of our shows. And then let, let's kind of talk about what's going to go on this year because you you said a lot of the events coming up. But for everyone who's listening there's you know the spring event there's the import event you know there's uh the corvette events chrysler events the hearst event what's going on with the hearst event this year what well, is what is that we i think a lot of people know the hearst olds and you see that a lot at chevy or gm branded shows but hearst had a hand in uh other uh production companies uh, vehicles. There, there are Hearst Fords and Hearst uh, Chryslers and things like that. So we uh, came up with this idea to show uh, to put on the first ever Hearst branded show, and it will be uh, all makes and models of Hearst, uh, whether or not it's it's a, a Chevy or a Dodge or a Ford or whatever. And it, we're not only going to have the cars, but we're going to have. Um, you know, some special guests that are attached to the Hertz, the Hearst world as well. Of course, we're going to have Linda Vaughn. Uh, I don't think you can have a Hearst event without having Linda Vaughn. We're going to have uh, Don Glover, who was attached to the, the projects uh, back in the 60s as an engineer. Uh, there's a gentleman named Dennis Kerbin, who is a big Hearst fanatic that has rare ar- artifacts involved with, with the Hearst uh, history. And then we're just going to have a cool array of cars on display. And the best part about the Hearst show, if you're into that, is that it's taking place at the same time as our big Chrysler show in July. So you could come and basically get two shows for the price of one. The uh, Chrysler show takes place on the fairgrounds, uh, July uh, dates, 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 12 14th shows. 14th through dates. 16th. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So 14th through 16th is the Chrysler show on the fairgrounds, and then the 14th and 15th will be the Hearst event about two blocks away at our Carlisle Expo Center. Okay, which is... Um, indoors, it's air conditioned. It's not, that's where the Ford, I think, did like a little mini auto show when I was yes. there. 
Ford yeah. puts on their their new product showcase there. They do the the test drives at the Expo Center. So there are some indoor air conditioned aspects. There are some outdoor features as well. But it really gives you a chance to take a look at a car that is. Um, or at least a brand that is associated with all of your popular makes and models. It, it, and it, it's weird when you start because you think of Hearst, you think of, you know, Hearst shifters, you think of, you know, all the Dodge products kind of associated with that. But, you know, maybe this is something where maybe one day we'll see a Tremec Nationals or something like that. Um, but it, it's a great starting point for that. It, it's, such an iconic brand. It kind of went away for a while and it's back now and kind of it's in back in vogue. So I can't think of a better time to kind of start up a uh, Hearst Nationals. So good time. Yeah, and it's it's something that at uh, um, one of our bigger automotive shows that we went to as a, as a company to set up a trade booth, and I, I wish I could remember what show it was. Um, possibly it was SEMA in the fall, so that's kind of a big deal, that uh, uh, a company executive that was associated with Hearst stood up and said, Hey, uh, Carlisle's doing the show. You should get out there. So there's a lot of excitement and a lot of buzz around the show, and we hope that it translates into uh, something fun for us, especially when you, like I said, when you can factor in essentially the two shows for the price of one. Yeah. The, that's the other thing, too. Is So how did the idea for the shows come about? Obviously, you know, spring and fall were kind of created by the original guys, but then, you know, you have the Ford stuff, you have the Corvette stuff. Like, how did those come into being? Well, I wish I could remember the launch dates for every show, but I know a show like Corvettes at Carlisle started in 1982, and it was our very first what we will call specialty show. So, uh, you know, a brand-specific event. Um, Chip Miller was a big Corvette guy. I mean, you think back to the story I I gave you about uh, Paul Carlisle. It it all um, centered around a Corvette. So he was very passionate about Corvettes. He's a a Corvette Hall of Famer uh, at the, the big facility in Kentucky. Um, Chip passed away in 2004, but his uh, his contribution to the collector car hobby will will always have its place. And um, you know, some of these shows were were launched out of a you know a demand or out of a popularity. Um, our import show has actually been around, I think, since 1986. And then you have kind of the rest of the shows. And you know, why wouldn't you have a Ford show? Why wouldn't you have a Chevy show? And and you know, Chrysler. Uh, as well. I mean, those three shows and even the truck show, they, they, they all central Pennsylvania is a big truck crowd. Uh, you know, it, it's a big, uh, you go mud bogging, go off road and, you know, that kind of, you know, I, I won't call it a, a redneck area, but you know, as, as the stereotypes go with guys that drive trucks, our region is, uh, is, is, is wealthy, uh, with, with that kind of, uh, you know, stereotype. And, um, but it, but it, it serves, I mean, these people, like the truck show is so fun. Like they're such great people. And so every show is kind of born out of a, um, a demand, if you will. And then the support that we get from the manufacturers along the way, having Ford corporate be at our event, having Chevy corporate at our Chevy show, having, you know, the Dodge and Chrysler representatives, the fact that Corvette engineers come to the Corvette show every year. Um, you know, these shows grew from, you know, a couple of hundred cars during their first years to thousands of cars now to um, we were just at the Detroit Autorama show and our event manager for the Chrysler show met with the Chrysler people and met with their their marketing and their events teams. And on the guy's desk was a list of all the events that that Dodge was going to take their uh, their new demon to 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 show off once they unveil it next month in New York. And it was a bunch of different like drag races and maybe some NASCAR and Carlisle. So you think about, you know, the, the big places that some of these companies go and that we are part of their tour each and every summer. I think that 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 says a lot for our brand. Yeah, it's I can't think of a better place for a manufacturer to try and understand what their product means to its you know core audience, because you put a. Dodge Demon, let's say, in front of a focus group these days, you're going to get kind of uh, mixed results, maybe. You know, people might not get it, you know, whatever, not their cup of tea or whatever. You go to Carlisle as a manufacturer, and the people will tell you what the brand means, and then you can kind of pull out of that, and that's how you make something as cool as something like the Demon. You know, I'm sure there's been a impact 
from Carlisle being there and from the corporate guys coming there and the engineers coming there, you know, the Corvette, you know, yeah, a lot of people give it some, you know, well, it's not, does it really a heritage because it no longer has the circle taillights or whatever the hell they're fastidious. Oh, the tail, the taillights, yeah. the taillights, man. I mean, and, and you think about like, and I know you're kind of joking, but think about when the C7 came out and how everybody was dogging that car because the rear end looked like a Camaro. Oh. Uh, you, you get to the show in 2015 and they bring the new 2016 C7 to the show. And I think I have my years right there, but whatever the years were, if it wasn't those, but you had the product engineers there. So anybody that was a little pissy about the fact that they didn't like what the taillights look like, you could talk to the guy that designed the taillights and he could explain to you what went into the thought process. And Oh, by the way, when you saw the car in person, it didn't look nearly as bad as the perception that you got from the pictures. It, and, and that's just the thing. Like you can, that's the great thing about that show is that the engineers, that's direct feedback from the core hardcore people. Like, um, I, I kind of <laughs> like if, if Carlisle ever puts on like a, Porsche 911 Nationals. I I fear for what may happen to the engineers from Porsche when they show up with stuff. But like Corvette people are as bad, if not worse, with that. And the fact that you bring that product to them at Carlisle, that's the place where you're meeting, you know, your constituency in a way. And that's as as long as you don't get run out with pitchforks, I think you do good. You know. Well, and and can you can you think of a bigger honor than what Chevrolet bestowed upon us in 2012? They named a color after us for the 2012 Corvette car. You could get a Carlisle Blue Corvette. So our brand meant so much to their brand that they bestowed a color name upon us, and it was really cool to see the Carlisle Blue Corvettes at the show. Our co-owner Lance Miller, who's uh, Chip's son, he has one. It sits in his office uh, right now. I got to drive it when it came out that first year because I needed to move it for a, a TV interview. And I'll tell you what, I was so scared behind the wheel of that car. I don't think I went faster than like four miles per hour. It was whatever the idling speed was or something. But um, it was it was such an honor to be able to drive that car and to know that Corvette thought enough of us to name that color after us. It was pretty cool. It's, I'm sure the impact Carlisle's had on the industry has been mostly – unsung in the manufacturers but there has to be a noticeable impact and for that that's you know all the enthusiasts owe carlisle a big you know bit of gratitude and really if you are you you got to get to carlisle at least once i'd say at least twice in your life just because the first time you're just gonna be like holy crap there's way too much going on here and then like the next time you can probably be like okay here's the plan of action i'm gonna go to the swap meet I'm going to get myself a pretzel and then I'm going to go look at all the cars and then I'll like take a nap and I'll come back and do what I need to do. Cause it's, it's a long day and it's, there's way too much to see in one day, probably way too much to see in like one week. In well, absolutely. And, 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 you know, for, for our car shows too, is like you get the people that come for multiple days, but the thing is a show like Corvette, there's no reserved parking. We have it, what's called a fun field. So that car that was in, I row space 54 on Friday could be an M row space 22 on Saturday. And, you know, you want to see all the cars, but you, it's probably not even possible to literally see every car at the show because they move and they're not going to be in the same spot. And, and one of the things we always say uh, specifically about the swap meet, like if you ever come to Carlisle and you're in the swap meet looking for something, if you don't, if you don't buy it right away, you better take damn good notes of where you saw it because if the parts, not there by the, or the if the part's still there by the time you want it, you're probably not going to find the booth because it's it's just so big. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the swap meet people are awesome, and it's a little it's a little intimidating at first. The people are awesome. I never heard a bad experience with it, but I'd also every time I see them, it tickles me pink because like they'll bring the heaviest crap on the planet with them, and it's like. Are you planning to hold like the, just the gas to get that from where you were to here has to be so much. But I think part of it is they know if they can get that to Carlisle, whoever buys it from them is going to put it into something. It's not going to sit on a shelf somewhere. It's going to be used as a vehicle, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. And the people are so dedicated. I mean, you can certainly thank um, 
I don't even say this because I care one way or the other about any particular president, but at least the last administration helped see through some lower gas prices and they've managed to maintain through the current administration. So the fact that there's uh, a little bit of a lower gas price, I think, helps our events a little bit. I mean, when, when gas was pushing $4 a gallon, I know the company was really uh, worried about the enthusiasts and whether or not they were going to be able to come because, you know, I said earlier that I like a good car payment and want on a vehicle with good fuel mileage. In case you haven't noticed, uh, nothing about the classic car industry is fuel economical um, from from the cars themselves to the trucks and trailers that have to pull them. If you're looking at $4 a tank of gas, you're not looking at a lot of car show enthusiasts because it's damn expensive to support that kind of addiction. Yeah, that's very true. I, I wonder, do you, do you keep record of who came from the furthest for any event? Like, I, I guess you wouldn't really want to be able to kind of gather that because it's, you show up, you give your money at the door and you kind of just walk in. Like, yeah, but, but we do, um, it's funny because for a company that's been around since 1974, um, last year was the first year we started taking credit cards at the gate for admission. We had always been a, a cash, you know, here, here's my cash, here's your ticket kind of thing. Um, so we can get a better feel. At the same time, when someone gets a swap meet space or buys a season pass or a weekend pass in advance or registers their car for the show, we know where they're coming from. Um we have had gate enthusiasts through that have come from as far as New Zealand uh, to our events. I can't think of anywhere that's farther. Um, we, you know, we get some South American people, but I'm pretty sure geographically speaking that New Zealand and Australia are much farther away than any place in South America. Um, we get people that come from Alaska. Um, so that's about as far away as you're going to get um, in, the, in, the, in the States, you know, Hawaii as well. Um, we had a guy a couple of years ago that had his Mustang shipped from um, Iceland to the States. He had it shipped uh, to Portland, Maine, and then drove it from Portland, Maine to Carlisle for the Ford show. And uh, I, you know, I can't think of uh, another circumstance that was as unique as that, but uh, – you know, you, you have these guys that are very passionate about it, and uh, you know they will go to any length possible to be part of the show. Now, in the time you've been there, um, what have you seen like kind of grow and evolve at the shows? The uh, the Ford show, as a show itself, has has grown tremendously. We probably will hit thirty five hundred cars this year. Uh, the Chrysler show has continued to grow. The Corvette show has continued to grow and aspects of our events that get bigger. It, people want to do more autocross. They want to do more things with their cars. So we, we provide autocross opportunities or, or drifting or, you know, we do the burnout contest. It's, it's not just that people want to come and show off their vehicles. They want to show what their vehicles can do. So that combined with, uh, you know, through our, our midway and vending partners, the, uh, the on-site installations, the, uh, you know, the aftermarket enhancements that people can have done to their cars. We've tried to make it really easy for that to happen at Carlisle. Um, you have companies that will do installs of, let's just say exhaust systems while you're at the show. So you, you buy the product, you schedule an appointment, you take your car to their booth, they'll put the, the exhaust on your car while you're walking around and enjoying the show. So, um, we, we see that growth as well. So there's just, and even our shows this year, they're all trending like 20% upward. So just when you think that, you know, the sky, you know, uh, the sky could be falling on the hobby like it was a couple of years ago when gas prices were high. Now it seems like the sky's the limit and, you know, we're never going to reach the top. It's, I mean, as it grows, as it becomes, I mean, you know, I can't imagine, you know, it's kind of got to be weird for you because it is such a big show, but, you know, it has worldwide renown. You know, it, people know what Carlisle is for the most part in the automotive industry now. You know, it's got to be kind of weird being the PR person trying to push a thing that a lot of people already know exists as a thing. Maybe if it's, you know, I guess what's the hardest part about what you do I, is what I'm really kind of getting down to the core of, you know. I think the hard part for me is to try and convey the message that our events aren't just cars in a field, that there really is a festival type atmosphere that appear, that happens at these shows. Um, we do two shows in Florida and the biggest hurdle that we find with our events there is that 
the I kind of think that the audience in Florida, it's it's a different kind of car enthusiast, and, and there's nothing wrong with the car enthusiasts in Florida, but it's a different it's a different atmosphere and a different approach than what we provide in Pennsylvania. You know, the, the car shows in Florida, you get a couple of hours in the morning, it's at the local grocery store or the local ice cream shop or something like that, and maybe it doesn't cost anything to participate, it doesn't cost anything to attend. That's that's a car show in Florida, but we try to bring something down there and establish, you know, multi-day registration, multi-day show, et cetera, et cetera, and we might only get 300 cars. Now, somebody might think, wow, 300 cars, that's a big show. But when when our smallest show is 1,400 cars and our biggest is 5,000, um, you know, a 300-car show has us looking at, okay, well, do we, do we need to figure out a way to change this approach? So um, to try and convince people that it really isn't just this cruise in, that it's much more than that, um, I, I'm – continually efforting to get on to a show like the Today Show or Good Morning America. We were lucky enough to be on Fox and Friends a couple of years ago, and that was a, a massive exposure piece for our company. And I think we have a real American success story with what the Miller families did in 1974 and what the families continue to do now in, in 2017. We, we're a small family owned company to this day. We employ thirty two full time people and two hundred plus more part time in the season. So um, you know, with the with the economic impact that we are to the community, the uh, the entertainment that we provide to, to millions of people around the world, I mean it's it's just something that, you know, I, I want the people that come to the show to realize that, like I said, it's more than just the cars there. And and if any, you know, writer or journalist or whatever is is listening to this this episode and you know, wants to come to Carlisle, I certainly encourage it because the stories that you will find, not the stories that I'm going to pitch you, but the stories that you'll find just by walking the show field and interacting with the people, you know, that'll sell magazines for years to come. You know, it's when I went last year, I went to the Ford show, as I've said, and in the space of probably you know, a small house. Like, if you just took that footprint, like maybe a couple hundred square feet, there was a guy there who had a car he imported when he was in the military. He did all sorts of work to it. He brought it over here from Germany. There was another guy who had an imported thing. Uh, again, weird little Ford car, but it was his first car. You know, had like a uh, uh, big impact on his life because it was something different. Uh, then you have like just the normal Mustang guy sitting there, and he's like, I just have this car, you know, hand me down from my dad, you know, all all the automotive stories you could ever want exist in Carlisle. Like if you're looking for a fluff piece, if you're looking for something to pull on the heartstrings and you're a journalist or you want to write stuff or if you're just an enthusiast and you just enjoy talking to people and hearing all the weird stories, it's all there. It 100%. Like it's crazy. Like Perfect. Yeah, you know, you're abs you're absolutely right. And that's, you know, like like I said, it's it's one thing as the PR person for me to have somebody want to write a story about us. I mean, all the exposure that we can get is great, but the the real stories are amongst the enthusiasts that are on the grounds and it's just something you've got to, you know, see firsthand, experience firsthand the the generations that uh come to the show, the families, the you know, there's been engagements and marriages at our shows, you know, people just it's such a family thing for so many. Yeah, it, I mean, it's it really is like a automotive mecca. You have to go at least once in your life. Everyone has to make that pilgrimage. You know, it it's you just have to if you're an enthusiast and there's a show for everyone, even the truck guys, you know, even they get to come and play. You know, <laughs> I really, absolutely. And, 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 you know, the cool thing about the truck show is if you have a Ford truck, you can show it at the Ford show. You can show it at the truck show. Same with the Chevy truck or a Dodge truck. We offer multi show discounts. So there's. There's savings. There's there's ways to save money. Why pay full price ever to come to an event at Carlisle? Yeah, <laughs> very true. It's I mean it's worth full price, but why not get the discount? Um, I know it's, it's such a it's such a playground. It's such a good place to be in the autocross and all the other stuff that happens. And like the Ford show, you get to drive the cars, you get to play in the parking lot, and then you get to come in, you get to see all the cool stuff and the swap meet. It's just so fun, and for everyone listening, if you haven't been, make a plan to go with this year. It, it's worth doing. Um, before we say goodbye for the evening, um, we're going to run through uh, some questions here, Mike. This is uh, the part of the show where, um, I don't know, have you ever seen Inside the Actor's Studio? Uh, I have. 
Okay, so he asked a series of questions, and we've, because we like to be the automotive podcast of record, we have some series of questions for you to, you know, quickly answer. So um, these, are, these are uh, not as taxing as they may, they're not very intimidating. Let me just, we'll start with the number one. Uh, what's your favorite car? I like probably anything out of the you know the, the 70s era Mopar um, stable. Um, I, I think the Chrysler show is probably my favorite show of the year, so I, I, I like looking at those kinds of cars. All right. Uh, what is your least favorite car? I'm not sure that I have a least favorite car. I enjoy them all or I hate them all. I'm not sure which. But um, I, I don't have one that I look at and say, eh, no. Mm. I'll, I'll accept that in this particular set of circumstances. Well, because the, the reality is if I tell you that I don't like a particular type of car, that car is probably a car registered at one of our events, and thus I've offended someone. So um, This is true. That's why I'm like, well, we'll let that one slide. Officially, here. I really don't have a car that I don't like. I mean, whatever. If, if it gets me from A to B, it's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what modification like of vehicles do you find yourself liking? Like stance cars, lifted cars, anything like that? Like, is there a trend or a style that you really like? I like as as a Central PA native. If you take like a Ford Ranger or a small Dodge Dakota and you give it just a little bit of a lift, I like that. I, I'm not a big fan of you know the big jacked up trucks. Um, the, you know, the slammed and the stanced cars to each their own, but, um, you know, that, that slight lifted modification to, um, to a pickup truck. I, I, I think I, I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. Well, and then the flip side of that, um, which trend we like to say, which trend turns you off? Not necessarily that you hate it, but it's something that you don't find aesthetically pleasing. Oh, what don't I enjoy? I think you asked this question already. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, there are head scratching moments when I see people doing things to cars that, I mean, probably the tuner hobby, I, you know, I can only dance around it for so long. The, um, you know, the, the tuner hobby, the, the, the people that are into that hobby, they probably spend more money on their cars than the Corvette people. Um, so they're very passionate about what they do and, and the custom jobs that come out of those cars, they're very, very good, but I just don't see it, you know, to, to spend that kind of money to shave out your engine bay or to get everything all talked or, you know, the, 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 the amount of pyres that get wasted because you've got, you know, the, the camber is such that it's, you know, the, the inside of the tires are rubbing all the time or, you know, drifting or I, I, I don't get it. And maybe it's because I'm a man of a certain age, but, uh, you know, it's that get off my lawn mentality, but I, I just don't get it. Yeah, it, that's the thing. Like it, it's not so much that you have a, disdain for it it's just there's certain things where you just can't understand it that's kind of what we're trying to get at so that's that's a good answer for that because it's like I, I have a very similar problem with the stance people like i just i appreciate the work i just don't understand it um right the here's a good one what is the car you dread to be stuck behind at a red light now this doesn't need to be a make or model of car it just has to be you know Maybe you notice something about a vehicle, like loud, maybe... loud, loud rap music. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get that one. That I, I when it rattles the inside of your own car from yes, the outside. Yes, yes, and it's not okay. Maybe, maybe I've gone too far by saying loud rap music, but any kind of vehicle that's cranking tunes that makes not only their car rattle but mine too. Yeah, like why are my body panels shaking inside my car? Um, but there's no, there's no decimal drag racing at Carlisle, is there? Um, no, no, we, we do have a, an exhaust competition, but it's not based on any kind of DB levels. We just have, you know, the quote unquote experts that listen to a car as it goes up a hill and accelerates. And then magically there's a trophy at the end. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen the decimal drag racing people? I, I have. Yeah. It, that, that, that's a trend I don't understand. Like, like they fill their cars full of concrete. It's nuts. Um, <laughs> uh, what automotive sound or noise do you love? Um, 
the good the good revving of a nice muscle car. A little bit of that Mopar thing would fit in perfectly there. What yes. automotive sound or noise do you hate? Uh, like to give you an example, like a lot of people pick like the squeal of brakes when they're low. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like that, like high pitched thing. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. I, I got you because now I don't have to pick on the tuner people again. Yeah. Um, the, um, you know, like maybe when you turn the steering wheel a little too far and your belt squeals or, you know, something like that, like that is, you know, get your car fixed, dude. That yeah. kind of thing. I got you. Um, let's see here. Um, you know, Kind of already answered this one, but what other profession besides your own would you like to try? Uh, actor, television performer, something like that. And then in the automotive field, what profession would you least want to try? Least want to try? Yeah. Um, stuntman. <laughs> um. And then here's the question that I posed to all the guests, and I, I hope you thought about this one long and hard because it was in the prepared section. What is the hardest food to eat while driving? Well, as of two days ago, it's like the double thick burger from Hardee's because I feel like I may have worn some of it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think any kind of fast food burger is tough. Anything that's got a lot of sauce on it is going to be difficult. Because inevitably, after a few bites, it's it's seeped its way through either the side of the bun or out the bottom of the bun. Um, ice cream in the summertime is difficult because you just can't focus on you know where to properly lick the cone to make sure that it doesn't drip. Um, yeah, I think those things rank right up there. Mm-hmm. Hardee's is a good answer because Hardee's gives you that false sense of confidence with that little like half wrapper they put on it. Like, yeah. Like, I'm not going to make a mess. It's got, like, half a condom still on this thing. And then you bite into it, and it just explodes all over the inside of the car. Hey, nine, nine months later, a half a condom will cause problems. <laughs> Very true. Like, how did this lettuce get down here? And where did that well, come from? Well, it's like, we just, we just had a new Hardee's open in Carlisle, and I was like, okay, what the hell? I'll go try it. Like, I'm going to a fast food restaurant. It doesn't really matter what the name brand is. This isn't going to end well. It's a poor life choice in the first place. But I thought I'd give it a go. And the the little thick burger that I got was only four ninety nine, which was by far the cheapest thing on the menu. So at least I know I'm not going to go back because not because it's unhealthy, just because it's too expensive. And I'm eating this thing, and you know whatever special sauce or like Hardee's fake McDonald's special sauce they put on there, it's dripping all over the place. And I'm trying to go back to work, and I, I was worried that there was going to be a problem. Like, uh, Mike, what's that on your pants? Uh, that's not what it looks like. Uh. <laughs> it's it's orange. I don't know. I you know I I don't know. It's. I mean, before we go, we're 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 at time here. Um, before we go, let's. Uh, where is the best place to eat in the fairgrounds? In your opinion, in the fairgrounds. Uh. The barbecue stands are really good. We have a place called Horner's Corner Barbecue. Um, but the uh, Stoltzfus, it's this Pennsylvania Dutch group, um, they have chicken corn soup and these ham and cheese sandwiches that are really, really good. So if you want a real taste of central Pennsylvania, visit the Stoltzfus stand, which if you're in the food court is like the very last one uh, under the bleachers on the uh, – east side of the food court so that would probably be a place i would recommend all right and then this is very important because uh i know a lot of people might be traveling a distance before they arrive at carlisle where has the best um let's say restroom facilities for taking a uh you know sabbatical or maybe like a number two as the kids on the, would call it? On the fairgrounds or in yeah. the area well let's go with both uh <laughs> Well, I mean, like just regionally, I think when you got to go, you got to go and you figure it out. Um, on the grounds, the best bathroom is probably off the grounds. Um, <laughs> if in my the, the one in our office, but no, I mean, like our facilities are fine. They're the run of the mill. You know, like if you were going to your local dirt track or your, you know, Daytona or something like that, I mean, you're going to find facilities along those lines. So, you know, look you're going to a car show. You're not going to have your butt feel good. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it just if you're gonna go, just make it quick and don't spend a lot of time in there thinking about what's happening. And it, and maybe like if you're one of the women, like what is it, hover, don't cover, that kind of thing. So I don't know. I mean, in, in real life, like okay, we can all you know bathroom humor, haha jokes, but we actually have for all the part time staff that we employ, we employ restroom attendants. So we have people there to not only give you the paper towels on your way out, but they, they really work hard to keep the facility clean. We have trash people that work to keep the place clean. So, you know, you can make all the jokes we want about bathrooms and trash cans and whatever, but we even have a staff for that to make sure that things stay ship shape. I was, I was impressed. You know, you wake up, you have your caffeine, you're driving to the event, and then it's like, I'm going to have to use the facilities when I get there. Not not unpleasant. I, I would say it was, it was cleaner than I... You know, I, I, I'm trying to, because, no, I actually didn't go. No, I had to stop. No, that's right. No, I'm, I'm confusing myself here because I actually had to, this is the too much information section of the podcast. I had to stop before I arrived. So I actually never used the facilities on call out because I was going to put that in the review. And I never that's ended right. up doing that. <laughs> like, that's right. No, I'm confusing that with someone else. Um, No, so, yeah, it's, you got the staff, it, it's clean, it's automotive mecca. Why not go? Why not camp on the grounds if you can? If not, stay there a couple days, enjoy the event, come back the next year too because you're going to come back and you're going to see an experience completely different than what it was just because you'll have a better understanding of it. So, um, Yeah, and, and you know, and, and, and for 2017, you know, we, we talked so much general stuff, but, I mean, go to CarlisleEvents.com, check out our show page because we're going to have things like the very first uh, Cougar ever produced is going to be at the Ford show. The very first Camaro ever produced is going to be at the Chevy show. The Chrysler show has this awesome survivor's tent where you're going to see about two dozen cars that are pretty much, you know, 90% plus original like they were when they rolled off the factory line. Um, You might very well see the new Ford GT at our Ford show this summer. You get the chance to get uh, behind the wheel or strap into the passenger seat of some of the latest products that are coming on the market and you can talk with all those product specialists and get a real feel for for what goes into it. And, and you know, you're going to enjoy the show um, with celebrities around you. I mean, at the Corvette show in years past, we've had uh, G. Gordon Liddy at the show. I mean, he's certainly infamous in political circles, but he comes to the show. Reggie Jackson has been to the shows um, just as an enthusiast, not as a promoted special guest, but just a guy walking around enjoying the show just like you. Um, so you never know who you're going to run into when you come to a show. Yeah, and you might run into Mr. Regular making some poop jokes, too. And that's what he does. Um, <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah, so for everyone listening, the website is Carlisle Events, if I got my notes down. Yes, right. CarlisleEvents.com. There's two E's in the middle there. So CarlisleEvents.com. And you can go there and you can check everything out. We're coming up on uh, a few months away from Spring Carlisle, about a month and a half uh, until spring. April 19th is uh, is the spring date. And we're actually two events into 2017 already. We had a January show in Allentown. We just came back from our show in Florida. So we're, we're two shows into our 12. Uh, Spring Carlisle has a collector car auction as well. So if you're into an auction, our company does four of those every year, plus the shows. And it's just, you know, it's pretty awesome to have partners like McGuire's and Haggerty Insurance and and uh, all of our great Midway uh, groups that get involved. And, and it's it's so fun every year to do something like this at Carlisle. And then... Which which one are the four auctions? Because I'm curious about that. It's uh, Spring Carlisle, you said? Spring and Fall Carlisle, and then our two events in Florida, which are Fall and Winter Auto Fest in Lakeland. So right. if, you're, if you're into the classic car hobby and you watch all these auctions on TV, you can experience uh, one or more in person with uh, Carlisle Auctions. Mm-hmm. And then the Twitter for Carlisle is? At, at Carlisle Events. And then there's... There's a Facebook as well, if I'm not mistaken. There are many Facebooks. Um, <laughs> we have Carlisle Events itself has a Facebook page, and then each and every one of our shows has their very own Facebook page. So when you're on CarlisleEvents.com, um, like right on our homepage, there's actually uh, a tab at the top that says Media, and if you click that, it'll take you to the social media pages, uh, or at least it'll link you to where you can get to our social media icons, and uh, they can jump to you know, whatever social media page you want to check out. Right, excellent. Um, Mike, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, any, Anytime. Any closing thoughts before we uh, end the show here? Anything else you want to throw in, I guess? 
Other than really to say that there is something for everybody, um, you know, depending on where you're traveling, the Harrisburg Airport has nonstop flights from Detroit, from Atlanta, from Toronto. Um, if if you want a you know low budget airline, you you can fly on Allegiant between Florida and Myrtle Beach and Harrisburg, um, Punta Gorda, Florida. So you know air travel to the area is pretty easy as driving goes. Um, we're certainly connected by any one of those main roads that I mentioned uh, about an hour back, and uh, just you know bring your walking shoes and and get ready to have a good time. I mean it's certainly not going to be a cheap weekend, especially if you're you're looking to stay in a local hotel. But uh, you know coming to Carlisle to check out a weekend of car shows would be no different than maybe going to Disney World or uh, you know going to a NASCAR race for a weekend or something like that. You're going to have a great time. You're gonna you're gonna make new friends. You're gonna run into people that maybe you haven't seen in a few years. And it's going to be an experience that you'll, you'll remember for the rest of your life or until you stop remembering, whichever comes first. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, on that note, um, I'm going to say goodbye to Mike off air. Everyone who's listening, I'll be right back with you. All right. That was Mike Garland. Um, he was obviously working with CarlisleEvents.com. Um, if you go, you know, and you happen to run into one of the event guys, why not tell him that you came there because of the Untitled Car Show? Um yeah, I'm not getting anything for that. I just think it would be hilarious if we just harassed them like that. Um, if you're listening and you like the sound of my voice, you like the interviews I do, please make sure to tell a friend, loved one, coworker. Um, it helps the show grow, you know, so we can keep bringing you great guests like Mike. Um, you can follow our f- Twitter at Untitled Car Show. You can follow the Facebook at Untitled Car Show, Instagram at Untitled Car Show. You can follow our West Coast correspondent, Ryan West, at Ryan Ader 122 And, um, yeah, just tell a friend. Help spread the word. Um, there's going to be merchandise coming up, so keep an eye out for that. Um, thanks, everyone, so much for listening. Have a good night. Have a good evening. Wherever you are, whatever time it is there, thank you so much for listening. Be safe out there. <laughs>